Kaya? Kaya. Jupin Nunuk Jinani, Nala Katajini, Nunga, Mot Padaya Kayan Kadak Naja Puja. I respectfully acknowledge the past and present traditional custodians of this land on which we are meeting, the Nungo elders and people. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to ECU's Inspirational Leaders presentation, featuring the one and only creator and host of ABC's radio's science show, Robin Williams. Can I also extend a warm welcome to Mr. Ian Goodenough, the federal member for Moore, Mr. Jan Norberger, MLA, Dr. Phil Crosby, Assistant Director for Western Australia, CSIRO. Now, the ECU Inspirational Leaders presentations aim to engage ECU staff, students, and the community by inviting inspirational people in senior and leadership roles to share their experience in their given profession. Now, this Inspirational Leaders event features Robin Williams AM. And Robin, as you all know, is a leading science communicator. Robin has kept Australian audiences informed and engaged with scientific discovery, research challenges, and the wonder of the new. The Science Show has always delivered the element of surprise and amusement that has been driven by Robin's curiosity and sense of fun, and I'm sure we're going to discover that this evening. So we're in for a treat, ladies and gentlemen, because Robin's going to reflect on the past 40 years of broadcasting. And in addition to that, he'll touch on why science is crucial and the two revolutions that are currently changing science communication. I'm not sure what those revolutions are, so Robin will tell us. Without any further ado, Robin Williams. Thank you so much, Vice-Chancellor. Two points. Um, I love the way you said wonder. Because that's uh, many years ago what Brian Cox said to me when I interviewed him when he was about you know, 14 years old, hanging around in the, in the, in the distance, shyly. <laughs> and the second thing I want to tell you is you have one hell of a university here, which I knew already, but I've done interviews all day today and most of yesterday. And they're really crackers. I mean, they're fantastic stuff. And I'm really immensely impressed. I've called this talk In Love with Betty the Crow. That's weird, isn't it? <laughs> Has anyone heard of Betty the Crow? Um, one nod. Yes. You're a listener. You're a good, good. The, the, the rest of you haven't heard of Betty the Crow. And I'll have to explain later what I mean. Because I've stuck in this job since 1972. And for various reasons, which I'll explain for the next 45 minutes, one of the main reasons which I had reinforced today and yesterday is that scientists are such nice people. They really are amongst the pleasantest folk I have ever met. And not simply because they're being polite to me, but if you see them on Q&A, for example, and you feel, I'm, I'm now watching the program instead of turning it off and going, oh, how ghastly it is to see politicians fighting and being ghastly to each other. I remember when Brian Schmidt and Peter Doherty and others were on, and it was just so warm and friendly, and yet they were talking about significant stuff. It wasn't as if they were wimping out. So I find it absolutely terrific spending my life with scientists. I also am inspired by the fact that they are the most international body I know. You could say sport is similar, but no. Sport is temporary. You have to be young, mainly, and it's competitive. And there are unfortunate frissons sometimes, especially in some aspects of rugby when Wales loses, <laughs> which doesn't happen very often, as you know. And today, uh, Amongst the international people, I've met those from Iran, from India, from Israel, from the UK, from USA, several Southeast Asian countries, and this is a normal thing, and they're all working together. I was in an event in Cairns 
which was called a Brain B, in which 15 and 16 year olds from 26 countries competed in general knowledge about the brain. I could answer no questions. They answered them all. It was astounding. But they set the thing up with desks like the United Nations with little flags next to each other. In Israel was sitting next to Iran. And they were getting on famously. I thought if only the rest of the world could see how young scientists are working together. That is one of the reasons, again, why I've stayed in the business for 40 years. I grew up in Vienna, oddly enough. My parents there went went there when I was seven. There were a whole lot of international organizations there. And I had a library to go to, to get sort of random books. I read in German and I read in English. And the sort of things that I read sometimes turned out to be you know, ancient tomes of six or 700 pages, reading with a torch under the covers so I wouldn't get caught. But amongst my favorite were novels by Dr. In fact, by Hugh Lofting about Dr. Doolittle, animal behavior, talking to the animals. And I also found books by Conrad Lorenz, Man Meets Dog, and such like. And it inspired me to have, as a first love, if you like, in science, animal behavior. And it was quite interesting to see that Richard Dawkins also read Dr. Doolittle, and also, of course, read Conrad Lorenz and Ron Frisch, and uh, the study that he did with Nico Tinbergen. The three of them got the Nobel Prize. Just a reminder, the Nobel Prize is in a few days' time. Uh, but Nico Tinbergen actually taught Richard Dawkins animal behavior in the form of stickleback fish. So we had the same kind of nurturing through literature, kids' literature perhaps, but nonetheless it taught you about not just cuddly, furry things, you know, something that wasn't quite physics or anything serious, you know, um, science with steroids. No, this was about ideas. How can these small creatures understand things? What are their brains doing? Why aren't they like us? And I found it extremely interesting to try and cogitate on that. Many years later, having mucked around in television in England, doing various programs like Z Cars and standing in for Tom Jones and being in Monty Python a few times, those were programs, especially Monty Python and the Goodies, and Doctor Who, which were quite unremarkable. They were starting off, they weren't a cult yet, they were just funny little programs on television done by mostly overgrown students. And uh, so you went out and did them, and it was only years later that they became, in other people's eyes, highly significant. And because of my experience in some aspects of broadcasting, as a human prop, a friend of mine who had worked for the television and then became a film producer, came over to London and said, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I had no clue because in those days, in the 60s, you didn't plan to grow up because anyone under the, over the age of 30 was not to be trusted. And so I'd only given a vague idea of what I might do. He said, write to this person who was in charge of TV features. He did a series of programs called Your Life in Their Hands. His name was Humphrey Fisher and he was married to someone called Diana, or Bubbles Fisher, who was on the panel of the new inventors. And he looked at me, loose as I was, and I didn't care because I was just going to be in Australia for a year. I didn't care whether I got a job particularly or not. And so when he told me, come back in 10 years when you've got uh, the experience of producing any number of programs and written five books, I got really angry. You know, this guy leaning back, the son of the Archbishop of Canterbury, who'd been to posh schools, and I was rather acerbic, not rude. And so he sent me to his greatest enemy, the head of radio science, who, f by some amazing coincidence, had lost two members of staff the week before. So by a fluke, I got a job. And the first job was actually to do research on something very old-fashioned, which was walking on the moon. 
We don't do it now. But in 1972, in May, Apollo 16, and in December, Apollo 17, the last one, before Richard Nixon cancelled the project, I had to do the research. And um, Peter Pockley was in the studio, and we're doing live commentary. We're watching the screen and seeing these amazing cavortings on the moon, and we were getting the voice of Apollo and switching to that and trying not to speak over the top unless it was actually necessary. And suddenly Peter Pockley said, come into the studio and carry on. And I suddenly realized that if you're in broadcasting, you couldn't wimp out and say, oh, I don't do that sort of thing. Well, you actually have to. This is what broadcasting is all around. And so I then opened my mouth and said a few, no doubt, banal things. And that's how it began. And very quickly, I suddenly realized on the following day that I may not be equipped for this life on the ABC. Because what happened was this. Not Peter Pockley, but somebody called Michael Daly, who's now dead. He was there in the studio from about five in the morning. We went on all networks. It wasn't just Radio National. And he was describing what was happening on the moon. And then when you went out of sight of the moon, the broadcast stopped. And it was something like 8.40 in the morning. And Michael Daly, who was a New Zealander, a person whom we sometimes called lunchtime obus, said, time for a drink. I said, but it's not even breakfast yet. <laughs> and he said, well, come on, let's go. Uh, and, and, and there we were in, in William Street, waiting for the pub to open. And when we went in, he ordered the first drinks, which were a pint of yeah, an actual schooner of beer and some Irish whiskey. And that was something like 10 in the morning. So I was almost plastered by lunchtime, at which point he said, let's go and see Telford, because you know, we'd been in the pub, there was no one much in the pub, so let's go over the harbour. Now, Telford Conlon was Bill Morrison, the first science minister under Whitlam, his senior advisor. And so we went to Mossman and knocked on the door, no answer. And so I said, I know Telford. We go in through the front window, and I lifted the window and put my leg on the sill and then fell into the room where Les Murray, the poet, was having a reading in front of about 20 grand dames from the Mossman Blue Rinse set. <laughs> they wheeled me home about four in the afternoon with the most amazing tertiary alcoholic poisoning. I thought, I can't do this job if that's what has to happen. <laughs> Needless to say, the, um, the atmosphere in the ABC changed and we became far more disciplined. Uh, we didn't drink until 6.15 <laughs> in the evening. <laughs> and I carried on from there. Interesting times. And eventually, in 1975, someone thought I should replace Michael Daly, who'd gone over to television and do a rather longer program, and I chose the middle of the day. And so I went to Vancouver for the Pacific Science Congress and did science show number one, which I was delighted to repeat on the 29th of August this year. I did it, I repeated it, because it seemed to me that what was in it was startling. Because in that program, it was perfectly plain. The warnings of people of insight, experience, and high rank had been 40 years ago quite on the money. The first interview was with William Epstein from the United Nations talking about the arms race and the huge danger if we produced more and more nuclear weapons that terrorists would one day take some of these more pocket-sized nuclear weapons and hold the world to ransom. He spelled out ways in which it might occur. Next, Ian McTaggart Cowan, spelt Cowan like Edith, who was a very senior biologist at the University of British Columbia and then became a vice chancellor himself, lived to the age of 99, just missed out on the ton by a matter of weeks. But he talked about animal extinctions and the problems caused 
by our exploitation of habitat and the problems of biodiversity. Then Lord Ritchie Calder, and this is the one that I'd completely forgotten until someone played it for me about 10 years ago when there's another anniversary, the 30th or whatever it was. And suddenly there was Lord Ritchie Calder in the House of Lords whose son went on to launch new scientist, Nigel Calder. And Ritchie was saying, we've been digging up these fossil fuels. And he gave the tannages of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere and said, we're terribly worried about the effect this is going to have on climate. And it could be catastrophic. And he spelled it out. And then he said, we've been warning the world about this since 1963. And here we are in 1975. And still not enough has been done. May I point to Paris at the end of the year? We knew what was going on even then. Her Herman Kahn was head of the Hudson Institute. And he specialised in looking at forecasts for various nations. And I said, what about Australia? He said, commodities prices are going to crash. <laughs> I said, really? Yeah, what you need to do is invest not simply in what you dig out of the ground, but in value-added science and technology. Otherwise, you'll be left stranded. And then Gerard Peel warned about two things. Gerard Peel was the publisher of Scientific American. The first thing he said was there are going to be a new generation of nuclear plants, power plants, and they are going to be so safe you could have them under graveyards in Queens and Brooklyn. And the second thing he said is my life has been a failure because young people are moving away from science and this is tragic. That was all in science show number one. <laughs> and I thought, have we taken notice? You don't necessarily have to take notice of a radio program or a television program, but it's part of the culture, it's part of the conversation. And I wondered why it was that some of our leaders weren't really galvanized by some of those warnings from people at that level. Anyway, I rebroadcast the program and I found it salutary. In 1975, I'd been doing the science show for a few months. And I had no plan whatever to continue doing it. I was, on, you know, barely 31 and um, a 60s child. I was going to um, muck around somewhere else. And so I was being offered a job to be talks officer, you know, like David Attenborough was talks officer, because um, that's how we were hired in those days. In a public service sense, I was going to be talks officer Europe and have a lovely apartment somewhere in the middle of London and leap around the continent interviewing anyone I particularly fancied and having a wonderful time, care of your expense, and having got the job in December. Well, they, walked, they told me I had it in the end of November. Suddenly there was a change of government. And this is a wonderful Australian tradition. As soon as the coalition came in under Malcolm Fraser, they cut the ABC. That was the first job that went. <laughs> so here I was with the program on my hands, thinking, oh, well, I'll do it again and again and again. And the style at that time was, shall we say, slightly flaky. Because even though I didn't necessarily believe some of those countercultural things that people were talking about, nonetheless, the atmosphere was against scientism. You know, the, the scientists were these high priests who took themselves terribly seriously and reduced things in sort of the holistic way that the 70s child had been appreciating as the way forward that science should follow. And so we had uh, an, any number of people like Ivan Illich. Uh, if you have anything to do with medicine in an epidemiological sense, you may have heard of Archie Cochran, you know, the Cochrane standards of uh, evidence and so on. I once had Ivan Illich going on about the hegemony of the scientists and uh, medical problems that, in fact, Norman Swan was going on about last night on Four Corners. Oh, dear. Uh, but there was Ivan Illich being terribly continental, if you like. He is an ex-priest and talked about ways in which we are being deprived of any say in our health service. And I said to Archie Cochrane, 
online via satellite. What do you think of what you just said? He said, it's bloody bullshit, isn't it? <laughs> that's all he said. <laughs> Mind you, the conversation went on, but we had a sort of feeling that science itself was, it, you know, being left behind by the greater feeling for how the universe worked. Von Daniken had pointed out how many signs there were that aliens had been around. Uri Geller was on the front page cover of New Scientist, would you believe, having bent spoons. And it was a very strange era where we felt that we had to be rude to the guys in suits and the guys in long hair and uh, the women who were knitting their own cardigans and wearing flowers in their hair had the right of reply to take on those scientists. And that's the way we went until one day I did an interview with two people from the central highlands, New South Wales, who did past lives therapy. I thought this would be a great laugh. Um, <clears throat> and so he came in with her and all he had to do was touch her elbow and she went into one of her past lives, which in this case turned out to be someone who was running a space station, possibly on planet Og or whatever it was. And so I said, oh, you're there now. Tell me, what is the space station like? And she said, it's very big. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> and she said it again. And I thought, is that all she can come up with? treating us like bloody idiots. And I virtually kicked them out of the studio. And at that time, two of my friends, Dick Smith and Philip Adams, were forming the Australian skeptics. And I thought, that is enough, no more. And at that point, Jane, the great Randy turned up. And in the studio, he showed me how you could bend spoons. I had no idea how he did it but they were bending in front of me like wilting daffodils. It was quite extraordinary. And so we had a change in the way we approached science. And it was also an era when science itself was taking on some pretty heavy global situations. AIDS in the early 80s had come across our horizon. We had seen nothing like it before. And we would interview doctors who seemed to be gay, who were a few weeks after the interview dead themselves. And if you remember the adverts for taking care, the bowling alley and people with skull faces, it was very heavy stuff. And we also had the end of the space race. The space race had finished, as I said, in something like 75 in terms of going to the moon. The shuttle came up, but everyone was cost-cutting. There were explosions in space, and we were taking things very, very seriously. It was also hard doing interviews. OK, you had a number of stars in science, but quite not as many as you have today. There were certainly no Brian Coxes. Uh, David Attenborough stayed rather more behind the cam camera instead of in front of it. And so you had a few rather serious people who were telling you what um, a flex or a widget represented. And it was somewhat didactic. You know, there was teacher actually on television asking you to come up with the right answer instead of being in the classroom. It was all quite serious stuff. And then gradually matters changed. You see, most of the people we had on radio or television had had very little practice. And so we, through regular programs, were able, for instance, with someone like Peter Mason. Peter Mason was the foundation uh, professor of physics and mathematics at Macquarie University. And I offered him a book review of no great matter. You know, I just thought, oh, this is something that he could probably handle. And he did quite a good job. And he did this sing-song voice up and down, up and down, up and down. And um, it was fairly enthusiastic, but um, not not really great, but I was going to broadcast it anyway. I just gave him a few notes about what he was doing wrong. And blow me down, he took the note seriously. And the following week he came back with another talk.
that was ten times better. And having done it ten times better, he then did it again and was twenty times better. And much to my embarrassment, on one occasion he turned up with a three-part, three-hour series, including orchestras and sound effects and famous film stars doing walk-on roles. And I thought, look, 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 look Peter, um, um. <laughs> it was called From Genesis to Jupiter, The History of Navigation. I <laughs> really... <laughs> Can you imagine anything more embarrassing than the history of navigation unless it's the history of rubber, which he did next? <laughs> and so there we were. I had a, 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 this, this three-part series on my hand. I thought, what I'll do is I'll bury it in the summer recess. And so we put it on there, and the phones went berserk. Listeners couldn't get enough. Penguin phoned up and said, can we broadcast the book? This man, whose passion, whose interest and whose breadth of knowledge, but sheer enthusiasm had transcended the airwaves. This man who is a professor of mathematics and physics. Um, he went on, we did about five different series. They were all fantastically successful. And terribly sadly, the way it came to an end was, I remember there was something called ANZAS, the Australian and New Zealand Association for the Advancement of Science. I happened to have been president of it in 1992 in Brisbane, at the same time as David Attenborough was president of the British Association of Advancement of Science in Southampton in exactly the same year. We swapped notes for our speeches because both our organisations were up against it for cuts yet again. And this Melbourne event was supposed to be transforming the way we presented science to the public. Patrick Moore, who presented science, in fact, uh, the sky at night, for about 40 years, or was it 50 years, once a month, was one of the guests. And Peter Mason was orchestrating various things and encouraging the young children, and it was absolutely wonderful. And then Peter couldn't remember his phone number. You know, this, this mathematical prodigy couldn't even remember eight digits. And it was quite obvious that the brain cancer on the left side had removed his numeracy at a stroke. He lingered for a few months, but then he died. And before he died, I did an interview with him about how he was somehow coping with it. And he said, well, I've relied on the left side of my brain for all this time. From now on, I'm going to go for the right side and concentrate on the arts. And he did, because he had a spirit that transcended all that. Communication has changed dramatically. That's one of the revolutions that we've had in science communication. And the reason we've had that is against your expectation. Young people have had the chance to do what Peter Mason did and practice. You know, scientists aren't bad talent. They're better than lawyers and accountants. They're certainly better than politicians. Who else is fantastic? Tell me, at a communication on radio or television or standing on their feet. Give them a chance to practice and they get better and better. And this has been revolutionized by the three minute thesis competition, which not only gives them a chance to distill their work in three minutes and learn how to communicate, whoops, and not bash the microphone, but the act of doing so tells them more about their science. Think about it. <laughs> Trying to make a haiku out of something that needs usually a whole hour to distill gives you the essence and then you have the enthusiasm as they're working together. You know, sometimes we have 81 people actually doing in one minute in the lead up to the three minute thesis finals. And then you have FameLab, which I helped MC up the road in Fremantle. 
And that movement is transforming things in a way that I found quite startling. And the evidence for that, I go for evidence, yes, not just the feeling of goodwill. We had for the science show five under 40 competition. So that's five scientists under the age of 40, and we had 500 applicants, and Fiona Stanley and various other people who are doing the culling told me that they could have appointed the first 200 easily as being excellent, transformed through this process of practice and cognition and, and really talking to each other about their big ideas. We eventually got 12 as a final list, and I couldn't have got through that number. I mean, I wouldn't have stood a chance against any of them. I promise you. And we had five. And as soon as they came into the science unit, they were broadcasting like crazy as if they'd been doing it all their lives. It was fabulous stuff. And they were doing it with sound effects and interviewing each other and doing drama. If only we could hire them normally <laughs> instead of having the University of New South Wales subsidise a temporary arrangement. I'm telling you, round the country, we have stars all over the place. And all we've got to do is create the circumstances which gives them a go. I think it's fantastic. Well, okay, briefly, the revolutions. Um, first of all, communication. Second, the women in science. That has been, for me, the most gratifying thing of all, really. It's been quite stunning the way Many women, most of them called Fiona in this state. <laughs> I remember when Fiona Woods turned up on a bike to be interviewed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there she was, totally informal. We sat on a bench, recorded the interview, then she went off to look after her, was it six kids? I can't believe it. And when I first did coverage of the Nobel Prizes, which as I tell you on next week in the first week of October, 12 sort of women had ever won a Nobel Prize for science. And a quarter of them were in one family, the Curies, <laughs> you know? Two for mum and one for daughter. Take them out of it and there's what, eight or nine left? That has been transformed. They're winning Nobel Prizes far more regularly, our last one being Elizabeth Blackburn, and the Fields Medal, the first one for mathematics, which is equivalent to a Nobel Prize. And they are at a junior level in schools here and in Britain and in other parts of the world, outstripping the young men. Far more young women are doing science at that level. Far more at university first degree level as well. If only we could get them up to the most senior level, as you know, only 17% of women in the top jobs uh, instead of maybe 50-50. But they are really coming on strong. And some of the names I could mention, not just from the University of Western Australia and uh, from Edith Cowan, but from the University of New South Wales, I mean, Michelle Simmons, fellow of the Academy of Science, one of the youngest we've ever appointed, and a fellow of the Royal Society, working in quantum physics. I mean, they're fantastically able. So here come the women. And also here come the animals. You know, I left you with animals when I was reading books in Vienna and thinking, what does this mean? What are they actually thinking, these creatures? And Betty the Crow, there she was, in Oxford, where else? in Alex Koselnik's laboratory. Alex Koselnik is the professor of zoology. He comes from Argentina, and a uh, wonderful team. And they were trying to work out something that Jane Goodall had found with chimps, as you know. Chimps weren't supposed to use tools, but they do, and they did. And she revealed it, and the, the news went around the world. Well, <clears throat> Alex Koselnik and the students gave great big enclosure of New Caledonian crows. Hooks lying over there and tubes of food over there. And the only way you can get the food out is to get hold of a hook, put it down the tube and hoik out lunch, which the male crows did very happily. 
took them about five seconds to work out what was going on, grabbed the hooks, and away they went, leaving Betty. Now, someone in the, you know how students are lax, someone had just left the video running. And when they came into the lab the next day, the diligent student, oh, must watch what happened. And there was Betty the Crow with no food and no hooks for some reason. I think the males had gone off with them. You can actually see this on YouTube now. And Betty found a straight wire, looked at the tube, did the measurement, bent the wire to exactly the right dimension, did engineering, and then had something to eat. This was not supposed to happen. It went straight into the journal Nature and went round the world on front page. I'm surprised you don't remember. I do, because this was followed up in Cambridge and again in Oxford. They did, last time I saw Alex Koselnik, he was doing it with our own sulfur-crested cockatoos. You put the food in the cage and have five locks with different apparatus. And they worked out for each different lock how to get rid of them quickly and got the food. These are bird brains. What's going on? And of course, Nicky Clayton in Cambridge doing similar things with pebbles where you actually have to do what Archimedes did. <laughs> you, you drop the pebbles in the tube and the water comes up and there's the worm. Bingo. Took them no time to work it out. And she says, OK, we've got lasagna brains din, done in a particular way and they've got and IT, IT people would understand this. They have pizza pepperoni brains with obvious concentrations of abilities that you could not actually forecast. It's astounding stuff. Dogs similarly have been a revelation. Now my partner, Jonica Newby, did a series for me at a time when Bob Wayne from UCLA was suggesting that we have had the companionships of dogs for 120,000 years. Now, that's a long time, given that we've only been around as modern human beings for 200,000 years. But if you look at the archaeological evidence, it only goes back to about 17,000 years, which is quite long enough, actually, when you think of it, you know, 5,000 years before now, that's the pyramids. Well, 17,000 years is a long time for us to be with dogs. But it's even longer to be 40,000 years. The only problem was we didn't invent fences until about 10,000 years ago. So if you were a dog and you wanted to go back and have fun with wolves, who used to be part of your gang, then you just wandered off under the tree and went for it. And you didn't ne necessarily leave any anatomical difference between dog and wolf for scientists to discover all those years later. And it's only when you actually look at the mitochondrial work and the DNA, as well as the morphology, that you can then begin to get a story, which now, according to a few people I've talked to in the last three weeks, goes back to something like 40,000 years. Jonica's series suggested that because we were able to work with dogs, even though it wasn't planned at the time, but their noses led us to prey, and their early warning systems gave us as they were around the campfire and we could chuck bones and uh, they would you know, maybe be a bit leery of us, but nonetheless they were around. They could help us do things a long, long time ago. And my Oxford um, interlocutor said, here comes civilization and without the dogs, it wouldn't be like this. And I find that quite fascinating. If you think I'm being romantic, simply look a few weeks ago at the cover story of the journal Science. There it was, you know, the science of dog. And also the fact that they're still arguing about whether it's 40,000 years, 60,000 years, I don't care, it's interesting. It's fantastic stuff. Another revolution, here come the animals. But another revolution in science communication if you look at the young people and the practice three-minute thesis competitions are on about, um, it comes with something called citizen science. You know all about this. Uh, I came across it a long time ago, care of not just the uh, natural history people, you know, collecting butterflies and doing it in a genteel way as they used to do in the 19th century, but Chris Lintott, 
who actually took over from Patrick Moore in the sky at night and uh, does excellent work in astronomy in Oxford. And um, they recruited members of the public from the age of six to the age of maybe 85 or 86 to help them sort galaxies. Because obviously, if they left it to the PhD student, it would take 365 years, which they didn't have. If you gave it to citizen science, they could do it in a few weeks. And when I saw them last, they had well over a million citizen science working with them. And of course, the whole way in which you work with them is to give them feedback. You don't just have them as slaves. There has to be a relationship between the, the working scientist and the people who are the citizens who are helping you do the work. And this is flourishing. Whatever you do with cutbacks, this is going on in a way that has, you know, forget Yuri Geller, forget von Däniken. You have real excellent scientists and good work being done by citizens and it's only just taking off. Let me just tell you, finally, well, what is my main concern? It may have been affected by something that happened two weeks ago when we changed Prime Minister. If you look at National Geographic, a very restrained magazine, this is the edition from March the 1st. It is entitled The War on Science. Why should such a conservative organization as National Geographic warn about the war on science? Climate change does not exist. Evolution never happened. The moon landing was fake. Vaccinations can lead to autism. Genetically modified food is evil. Why is this going on? How is it with all this science communication and all this science education we still have that kind of negativity being thrust at us when we know quite clearly that the argument is on the other side, but even so, it does, you know, what they're saying is not, it may be open to question. They're saying it's wrong. Why is it that Paul Nurse, the president of the Royal Society of London, in his first few weeks as president, did a film for the BBC also called The War on Science? What is going on? If you look at some aspects of the world in which we are struggling to make sense, and then you look at the performance of science, science has its faults, it's flaky, as Norman Swan showed on Four Corners last night. There are all sorts of problems where we must actually put things right. But you look at the successes. Curiosity, the land on Mars finding again and again, astounding things. Today they announced flowing water. Pluto, you plan for all those years and you <laughs> travel for six years, five billion kilometers, and you take close-up pictures of the most distant planet. Rosetta, again years, landing its vehicle on a comet. Ebola, they think they've got a vaccine that's 100% workable. It's astounding. Gardasil, Ian Fraser, I hope it gets the Nobel Prize in a few days' time. Probably won't happen. Wi-Fi being developed from, as you know, the search for little black holes. On and on it goes. These it's wonderful discoveries and achievements. And yet, people say that it's the entrepreneur in business alone who is the person who provides the wealth of the nation. Well, you know, here's my mobile phone. It's got a, a pear on it with a bite out of it. And uh, it's got a little chalk inside and you write. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful device. But if I was Steve Jobs and I was holding this up, Steve Jobs didn't actually develop any of the technologies that made your iPhone work. It was all done on campuses or in the case of the CIA, by state-funded enterprises. CIA helped develop the touch screen. And that is the way forward, as I think the Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister, understands. It's a case of investment and of collaboration, finding ways that we can work together, 
that the scientists, the young people doing degrees on this campus, I hope will have an experience before they graduate even of working with corporations, working with firms, getting experience of the world that they hope to join so that this collaboration, which is at the moment bottom of the OECD list, can at least get halfway up and we can join organisations that, uh, for instance, Israel boasts with the greatest number of startups in the world because they invest twice as much on their research <clears throat> and getting the wealth that pays for it, which is quite extraordinary. So invest, collaborate, and don't simply wait for things to turn up. But above all, may I say, Vice Chancellor, and the people who look after the young brains in this campus, give them a go. Don't just let them do all this work, have all that enthusiasm, be on my program talking about their fantastic PhDs and the shape of the future, and then just let them go nowhere. That would be wrong. And I know I was just a hippie walking in off the street, but you can't do that these days. You don't even have a door that's open to let you make a fool of yourself. But anyway, that's the first 40 years. Thank you very much. Thank you.